So a lot has happened in the last couple of weeks. Um, so remember standing here, standing here in the back a few weeks ago when Brian announced that he'd be leaving and uh, telling everybody that God had called him away to another place. And as I kind of thought through that over the last week or so, as the elders asked me if I would preach today, um, I kind of just kept coming back to now what? You know, now what's going to happen? What, what, what do we do now? And I think that's probably a sentiment that's probably echoed uh, throughout the church. I think a lot of people have probably thought that, you know, what, what do we do now? What, how, how do we go on? What changes? Just, just all these questions. And I think, I think if we're just perfectly honest, it, at times we probably are just kind of paralyzed by the change. That, 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 that here we had thought that, as Jason said last Sunday night, as he sat up here and spoke about Brian, that, that we thought, okay, we've, we've got this all planned out, you know, for the next... 20 years or whatever it is that we're just going to be chugging away all together and and you know we looked at the staff how the the you know the person who had been in the shortest period of time is like six years and we really just thought that god really had it all like planned out and together and we had figured out god's plan and honestly i as as uh jerry came to me and said hey we want you to preach on the fifth i was just like i don't know if i want to do that I mean, think about it. We, last Sunday night, we sat here for an hour talking about how amazing the last 10 years were as Brian came to the church and things changed and, and people got saved and marriages were changed and all these different things and he leaves and then I get to get up here. I told him earlier, it's like being that guy who like bats after someone who hits a grand slam. Like, you don't remember that guy. You don't know who that guy is. Like, he didn't win the game. The guy that you hit the Grand Slam did. And I mean, if, if I'm honest, I've just I've thought about over the last week or so, like, just the tiredness that a lot of us feel, right? I mean, can we be honest just for a moment? We're all tired. We feel like we've just been going 90 miles to nothing. And I mean, just things going on in the, in the world around us and our families. I know for myself, my mom's been sick and it's just been difficult and I got to share with the people this morning that, you know, it's just been one thing after another. And I mean, I just keep coming back now to now, what do we do? And I think as I've wrestled with Scripture, because that's kind of what I've done over the last few weeks is is wrestle with Scripture about what I would say, what I would preach and, you know, what what truth I would give today. My scriptures changed. I, I, I went from something to something else. And and I think that two things really resounded to me as, as I kind of went before God uh, is what would I would say to you today? And the first one's the one that I've echoed over and over and is that God was not surprised when this happened. That even before Brian came, even before Brian was called on the ministry, God had his steps ordained for him. He had it lined out for him that, that he would do certain things and that God would use him in certain ways. And, and at the end of the day, What we want doesn't matter as much as what God wants because God's will is perfect. His steps are perfect. The way he has it ordained is perfect. So God was not surprised. God was not in heaven trying to come up with a plan to figure out how to keep this going. He was not surprised because he'd already laid out before, honestly, the foundations of time, what he would be doing. And the next thing that God really, I think, gave to me was that, that the mission of this church has never changed. What is the mission and what will always be the mission is, is, is Matthew 28 and that we're to lead people to a growing relationship with Jesus. We're supposed to go out and we're making disciples of men. That's our mission. And regardless of who's up on this stage, regardless of who's on staff, that's the mission that will remain. And so what I want to do is I want to look to some scripture today and I want to look at the cha- uh, first chapter of Acts And I want us to kind of look at Christ's own disciples and kind of listen in on what he told them right before he ascended into heaven. Now, think about the kind of the context of where we're at here. We're in in Acts chapter 1. We're we're at the point where Christ has been on the earth. He's rose from the dead. He's been on earth for 40 days. He's he's walked. he's, He's spoken to. He's ate meals with. He's just lived a life around these guys for 40 days talk to him about different things we don't know all that he said but we know some portions and 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 he's been with them and they're kind of 
getting used to it, right? I mean, they're used to the fact that Christ is with them there. He's in his glorified, he's, he's, he's been raised from the dead. And he's at the point where, where they know he has conquered death. He's conquered sin. And so they're walking along with him. And in verse 6 there, they're, they're talking. They said, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? So think about what they're asking here. They're, they're looking at him and they're saying, you know, God, have you come back? Christ, have you come back right now? Are you the Messiah? Are you the one that's going to come? And you're the one who's going to not just conquer sin and death and everything, but are you now here to reestablish your kingdom? Now, we know they're confused. They don't really understand. And, and, and partially so because the Holy Spirit had entered into them. They don't really understand a lot of things that they're going to understand later on. But, but they look at Jesus and they say, are you here? Are you going to reestablish things? And what they're really honestly saying, if we get down to the core of it, is are you going to make life easier for us? Because at the end of the day, what's going to happen when the kingdom of heaven comes back and it's here on earth, when Christ comes to reign again, is all sin is going to be pushed out of the world, all destruction, all that junk is going to be gone, and he's going to establish his kingdom here on earth. And at that point in time, they're looking and they're thinking, man, we're going to be in positions where we're going to help Christ rule over these nations. And no longer are we going to have to go out and get made fun of and ridiculed and, and, and martyred and all this stuff that happens. There's going to be no more John the Baptist to get their heads chopped. I mean, it's, they're going to be established as these leaders over the nations. And so they're just looking at Christ and going, man, is it time? Is it time? Is it come? Is, is that the time we're at right now? And Christ looks at them and says, uh, it is not for you to know times or seasons the Father is fixed by His own authority. They're saying, is it time, God, or do you come to establish again your own kingdom? And, and Christ looks at them and says, well, it's really not to you to know. See, when we question what happened two weeks ago when God called Brian to Colorado, when we question that, we're, we're really questioning what God has planned for Brian. We're really questioning what path that God has for Brian. And, and honestly, we're questioning what path God has for our church. And see, he's telling them right there the same thing I think he's telling us is that it's really not of you to know why I'm doing certain things. It's only for you to understand that God has it in his hands and has it in his control. See, and so he's ordained this. We believe that and we trust in that. Then we have to understand that what he does is good for us. What he does is not just good, but it's best. And so he tells me, he says, it's really not for you to know, but he goes on. He says, but. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes. He's, he's been talking about this. He's been telling about this. That I must go so the Comforter can come, the Holy Spirit can come, and He's going to do these amazing things in your life. He's going to be with you. He's going to comfort you. He's going to correct you. He's going to discipline you. He's going to do the things that you need Him to do. And since you're going to give Him power, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So he tells him, he says, it's not yours to know when God will do what, but it's yours to do. See, we don't have to know everything. We just have to do what God tells us to do when he tells us to do it. And what he tells them, he says, you need to reach out and not just worry about Israel. Because that's really what they were doing. They were worrying about Israel. Will God reestablish it? Will God come down and basically wipe out the rest of the world? And will he establish Israel as his chosen people, which he already had done? But will he let them then rule over everything? So they had kind of this messed up understanding of what God was here to do. He says, but I'll send you the Spirit, and the Spirit's going to allow you to not just reach out to Jerusalem, not just right here, not right now, not just the people around you, not just the Jews, but I'm going to have to send you, I'm going to give it the power to send you into Judea. I'm even going to send you to Samaria, he says. I want you to go, and this power is going to allow you to go into Samaria. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But, but he wants to go into Samaria, this region that honestly they would walk around. They wouldn't even go through. They would walk around it because they felt it was so uh, wicked and dirty and just below them. And he says, we're actually going to give you the power to reach out to the ends of the earth. Now, you got to think about that. You know, we're, we're a global society. You know, we, we, we think about things as a, as a world view. But, but in their, their idea, in their context, they're looking at Israel and what they know. And what they know is the people of God live in Israel, that they're the chosen people. They're the people that God ordained to be his people. And they know that everybody outside that is typically Gentiles, pagans, barbarians. 
And so they're not really concerned with that. They're concerned with their own people. And God's telling them, I'm going to give you this power that's going to help you to look outside yourself and realize that I've come to reach all people. He goes on, he says, and, uh, uh, and when he had said these things, they were, look, they were looking on and he was lifted up and a cloud took him into, out of sight. So Christ gives this command to him. He gives this calling to him. Tells him what they're supposed to do and then boom, he rises into the, in the clouds. He goes away. He goes to his father. He goes to heaven. He goes to his proper place. And I imagine that they're just all just kind of sitting there a little bit perplexed by what just happened. They got this calling. They got this thing that they were supposed to do. And now the guy who they've walked with for three and a half years, close as a brother to them, the guy who had taught them all they know, they had seen something inside them. They didn't see themselves. Boom, he's gone. And I imagine they were a little bit lost and perplexed, just like we've been a little lost and perplexed. I imagine they're a little confused, just like all of us have been a little confused through this whole thing. But what comes next is pretty amazing to me because what happens is he says that in verse 10, it says, and while they were gazing into the heaven as he went, and I just imagine they're just literally just standing there looking at the sky. And probably long after he's gone, they're looking at the heaven. They're thinking, okay, he's, gonna, he's coming back. He's going to come back. I mean, just staring. Just kind of confused. Looking at nothing. Just staring. And all of a sudden, angels appear, it says. And it says, when the angels appear, it says, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking at the heavens? God sent angels to look, tell them, Guys, seriously, what are you doing? God gave you a command. He said, Go and wait for that comforter to come. Wait for that spirit to come. And when that spirit comes, there's going to be amazing power that comes upon you. God does not intend for you just to stand here just paralyzed staring at the sky. He expects you to go out and do the thing that, that He called you to do. And it says that this Jesus who has taken up from you into heaven will come the same way as you saw Him go into heaven. He says you know, He's coming back, but there's no reason for you just to stand here and stare. See, as I read this text, and as I looked through this over last week, the thing that really came to me, the thing that really motivated me was that our command has not changed. No matter who the man is that stands on the stage, no matter who leads this church, no matter who is here to teach and speak God's truth, the mission has never changed. The command has never changed. That mission for us is to lead all people into a growing relationship with Jesus. That's the same as it was when Brian came. It was the same as it was when this church was established. It's a change it will be when all of us are dead or gone. It will constantly be that we're to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus. See, I don't feel like I came today to really teach you anything new. I think I just came to remind you of something you already knew. Remind you of something. See, if you look at the Old Testament, a lot of times Israel needs to be reminded, right? They go through different trials. God sends a man of God to them to speak to them, a prophet. And he speaks truth into their life. It's nothing new. It's nothing that they didn't know. It's just something they had forgotten or something maybe they had in such fear and trembling and everything else had kind of pushed aside. But I'm here today to tell you our mission is the same. Our mission is to lead all people into growing relationship with Jesus. See, the answer of what do we do now is that we continue to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus. And see, that may seem difficult. It may seem like a daunting task. But here's what I want to do. I want to look at what God told his disciples, and I want to apply it to what we do every day. See, Jesus said he went and he said, go to Jerusalem. Go to the people you know. Go to the people around you. And speak truth in their life. At Matthew 28, make disciples. Make disciples of men. And see, what that looks like to you is you go to your job because that's your Jerusalem. That's the place you're around. Those are the people that you're probably around more than anybody else other than your own family. And see, you speak truth into their life. You help disciple them. But you don't do it in such a way that you're a jerk. Okay? Y'all know that person, right? If someone came to mind when I said that. If not, you may be that person, just saying. But you speak truth. And what I'm saying when I say speak truth, I don't mean that you're just a good person. You're no silent witness. That's 
Forget that word. Don't, you're not a silent witness. You have to speak truth. And so when someone you work with is going through struggles, you show them in a loving way what God says about those struggles. You show them in a loving way. You help walk with them. You help bear their burden. So you, you walk with them through the difficult times and you help speak God's truth into their life. See, that's your Jerusalem, maybe. Some of you, you may not work. Maybe you stay at home. Maybe whatever. You're tired. Uh, whatever. You stay at home. Maybe you just don't work around people. I work home health. I'm not around a lot of people throughout the day. So your Jerusalem may be your street. See, my Jerusalem is Cleaver Street in Pecola, Oklahoma. A few years back, I was really asking God, what would he have us do? And God told me, he said, if you can't reach out to the people on your own street, you have no business reaching out anywhere else. And so me and Angie, we tried to start reaching out to the people on our street. Tried to learn some of their names. I realized I'd been there for several years and didn't know who the people who lived around me even were. That became very evident as I was at an event one day where we were giving away school supplies and I introduced myself to this young lady. Her name was Sonia. And I said, well, it's good to meet you, Sonia. And she looked at me and she goes, well, that's funny. I live 35 feet from your house. She literally lived across the yard from me. And I didn't know her name. Because both of us, we would come home, we would get out of our car, we would go in our house, and we never saw anybody again. And see, we realized we had to be purposeful in what we did. We had to go out and we had to get to know people. We had to show them that we loved them, that we cared for them. We, we did it in such a way that wasn't overbearing, and we did it in such a way that wasn't pushy, but we just let them realize we want to be a part of their lives. And see, so some of you need to start making intentional relationships on your street. That's your Jerusalem. That's the place where you're going to see people come to know God. And see, the thing is, as they come to know God, they're going to be intentional on their street. And before long, your whole street is going to have people that are being intentional about going out and reaching people. See, that's your Jerusalem. See, that's our Jerusalem. That's how this church continues to do what God has called us to do. See, the other thing he called them to do, he said, go not just into Jerusalem, but go into Judea and Samaria. And see, they had that in context. Like I said, I'm going to talk about that in just a second. Is Judea, that's where they wanted to go. That was fine. That was Israel. They wanted to be a part of that. They didn't want to go to Samaria. Samarians, good Jewish men would get up every morning and say, thank God I'm not a woman, a dog, or a Samarian. That's what they said. They would say that prayer. And see, the thing was, they felt that the Samarians were less than them because in the exile, when Israel had been taken out of Israel and taken to different places, these people had stayed behind. They had intermarried with other people and they weren't pure anymore in the eyes of Israel and so when Christ went and he talked to the woman at the well that was in Samaria that was a Samarian woman that's why it was such a big deal it wasn't just that he was talking to a woman he's talking to a Samarian woman and see God has said you need to go somewhere you don't want to go you need to reach out to somebody you don't really want to reach out to and see the thing is about our church we'll give you plenty of opportunities to do that See, I don't know if y'all know, but we partner and help with a deal called the Recovery Ranch. And some of you men need to go out there and you need to get involved. You need to be a mentor to some of those guys who are in the worst parts of their life right now, who are struggling and, and trying to do everything they can to get out of the mess they've got themselves into. And some of you who are good husbands and fathers and men, you need to be men and you go out there and you mentor them and you help raise them up so they can do the same thing. And see, ladies, we partner with, with the Second Chances Thrift Store. And they, they mentor women. They help them go through hard times. And some of you ladies who are solid women who can walk beside them, bear burdens with them, you be a part of that. That's Samaria. That's a place you might not want to go. And not all of you, it's the same place. But those are just two examples. We go somewhere that makes us uncomfortable in order to be spreading the gospel and spreading the truth. See, the last thing he tells them to do is go throughout the world. And this was a foreign concept to them because they thought Israel was the world. They thought everything outside of that was just away from God and never be close to God. And so he called them and said, go through all the world and use the words that, that I've given you through the power of the Holy Spirit to do that. And see, we give you opportunity to do that as well. See, I don't know if y'all know, but there are five missionaries in China right now, five families that we in some way support, either by going and visiting with them, helping them, support them, uh, sending them packages, 
praying for him, doing different things. Y'all know Carrie was there for a couple years. We supported her as she reached out to unreached people. We have a young man in Morocco right now that we are reaching out to, that we're helping support because he's over there. He's been there for two years and going back for two years. And he's reaching out to Muslim people and there are no Christians around. You can't even openly proclaim Christ. There's a young man that came from uh, Tibet that we've helped a little bit because he is on fire and he's church planning and he's trying to get these churches established all over Tibet. Rhonda Baxter, who's here today, I forgot her name in the first service, so she came up to me and told me what it was. And uh, she's in Europe, and she's helping support missionaries. She goes and she cares for them. She loves them. And see, some of you may not go, but you can do lots of different things. See, I, I, I'm, a, I'm just going to tell you, I was someone who thought they'd never go on a mission trip because it's just not what I feel like I'm called to do. But for some reason, Justin called me last year and said, we want you to go to China. And I was like, I don't know about that. I'm, I'm anxious up here. Have you seen the airports? Not good. And I'm just thinking, I don't know. I can, I can probably get out of this. And he goes, we need a nurse to go. And I thought, yep, that's it right there. I don't get out of this one, do I? And so we decide we're going to go, and I, I get to go, and I'm thinking, man, I don't know what use I'm going to be. I can barely speak English. And I get there, and, and I don't. I don't have any ways of communicating. And I, about the fourth or fifth day we're there, I get to go to a village and go to a house, and I get to see an 11-year-old boy who has bronchitis really bad and has had it for months, whose family just doesn't know what to even do because the doctors are pretty worthless and the health care is pretty bad. And I got to comfort them and reassure them and tell them how to take care of him and the things to do and and as we left i just tell you i'm about in tears guys because i thought god sent a guy halfway around the world to comfort one christian family and let them know that he's big enough to send a nurse all the way from america to look for his kid look out for his kid and see you might be that person that goes next and if you're not, maybe you're in a home group and maybe your home group has somebody that is really called to go that they just can't afford to do it. And your home group's going to adopt them, you're going to support them, you're going to raise money for them, and you're going to send them. And because of that, they're going to do amazing things and you're going to be a part of that. And maybe you can't do that, maybe no one feels like they're called, but you can put a package together and send it to the missionaries and just tell them how much you love them, how much you support them, how much you're praying for them. One of the things that the guy that we were with said more than anything, he said that it just comforts him to know that there are people out there praying. People that are praying for him that he was succeeding in the task that God's given him. Because he said at times it's overwhelming. See, that's the world. That's reaching out to the world. See, our command has not changed. We might not understand completely and totally why God does the things when he does them, but our command has not changed. And that command is to go and all the world and make disciples of men go out and do those things use the holy spirit's power that he's given you and go out see see the thing that's different about what happened right here in acts versus what's happening with us is they were still waiting for the holy spirit to fall we have no excuse we have that spirit inside us if we're saved that spirit resides with us and it gives us the power to go and do these things to do these tasks You might change lives for eternity, guys. You might be involved with that. And if you've been a part of this church for very long, you've already been involved with that. What I want you to know and what I want you to go away with is that our mission has not changed. The answer to what do we do now is we continue to do what we've always done, and that is to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus. If you'll pray with me. Father God, I just come before you right now, and I just I'm grateful, God, for people who who looked down their street and picked me up and took me to church and taught me about Jesus. I'm grateful, God, that you have given me the ability to be involved with a church, God, that is seeing outside of their own walls, God, and reaching out to their own Jerusalem, their own Judea, their own Samaria, their own world. And God, as we Stand paralyzed, staring at the sky, God. Allow us to hear from you 
as you tell us it's time to go out and do. It's time to go out and not be weary or sad over what was, but believe that what's going to be coming is even greater. God, we are grateful, God, for your grace, your mercy, your love, all you do for us daily. We just ask this all in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.